Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center on the road. I am, thank you very much. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution, which was created by the US Congress as a nonpartisan nonprofit dedicated to increasing awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people. And as part of this inspiring and urgently important mission, we've created a series of First Amendment debates across America. These are produced with the generous support of the Stanton Foundation, which I am so happy to acknowledge today. And we began in Chicago with scholars such as Jeffrey Stone and Eric Posner debating whether the First Amendment protects hate speech. We're here tonight with Justice Breyer and then a remarkable group uh, of scholars to continue that conversation. And then in May, we're going to Stanford Law School with representatives from Google, Facebook, and Twitter to discuss the future of hate speech online. These exciting and important conversations are part of our mission of bringing together the finest liberal and conservative thinkers in America to discuss areas of agreement and disagreement. You can check out these inspiring programs on the Constitution Center's platforms, including the Interactive Constitution, which I want you all to download. Not now because I'm talking, but after the show. And you will find there the top liberal and conservative scholars describing areas of agreement and disagreement for all five freedoms of the First Amendment and for every clause of the Constitution. All right, well, we're going to jump right in. It is such an honor to uh, be here with Justice Stephen Breyer, who among his many achievements began his career as chief counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee for Senator Edward Kennedy. He was uh, an inspiration for the creation of this remarkable institute. Please join me in welcoming Justice Stephen Breyer. Justice, welcome to the Senate. Uh, this is the chamber that you helped to create. You've talked about your time with Senator Kennedy, and you've talked about how impressed you were that you and your counterparts from the Republican side would get together to discuss substantive policy, policy ideas. Tell the audience why, when you were there, you think the Senate worked. Well, we were there, weren't we? <laughs> <laughs> and the, Senator Kennedy wanted it to work, and, and so did the others. So when I started as chief counsel, I'd been teaching at Harvard, and, and I came down there, and, and the first thing he did is he brought me into Alan Simpson's office, you know, and said, Alan, if you have any problems with the Judiciary Committee, call Steve. And he meant it. So he introduced me to the Republicans, as well as the Democrats. And the thing was supposed to work. Every morning, Ken Feidberg, who was on, you know, working with, with me, and, and uh, uh, Emery Sneeden, who was Thurman's chief person, Every morning, we would meet for breakfast, and we'd plan the day. Uh, was our, no, no surprises. Uh, uh, try to paint this good bill this way so a Republican can vote for it, and that way so a Democrat so we can get it through. Because Kennedy wanted accomplishment. That's what he wanted. Uh, all the judges that were nominated, we confirmed 200 Carter judges. And uh, everyone was investigated jointly by Duke Short, who was Thurman's staff person, and Burt Wides, or originally uh, Carmine Bellino, who was Bobby Kennedy's investigator. And uh, they wrote a joint report. I don't think they ever disagreed. And uh, you know, sometimes they agreed that we shouldn't confirm this person. I won't go into that. But, they, but the, the, uh, uh, that's just the way it was. It wasn't 100% perfect, but it worked pretty well. And you say, well, how, why aren't we there? I don't know. When I say, and I'm asked that, I say, well, what happens now? Uh, it's no so partisan and everything. I say, well, I would start, this is not a very nice thing to say. So if I say one thing, but not too nice. I say, try looking in the mirror. <laughs> because my experience with the Senate was they'll do what they think their constituents want. Not 100%, but you know. So let's calm down. And, but I don't know I have the answer to that. I don't. So I do have a cup, though. And this cup was given to me by my law clerks a few years ago. And I'd always quoting Senator Kennedy. He well, was so great working for him. I mean, he made life fun. You know, it was, it was serious. He wants achievement, but it was fun. And, and uh, 
don't take yourself too seriously. So we have seven things on there written, which he used to say, but I think the two most important were, one, the, 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 the best is the enemy of the good. He certainly believed that. And the other is don't worry about the credit. Now that he really believed it. He said credit is a weapon. And you have a choice between, you know, making an inch of progress and being the national hero in dissent. Hey, make the progress. Make the progress. The credit is the weapon. And how do you do it? Well, listen to what the other person, what a good idea you have. What a good idea you have. Let's see if we could work with that. That's Kennedy. That's what he was. And uh, when it would come the time for uh, the thing passes, and he used to say, look, don't worry about it, because if, if, if it's a good project, there'll be, plenty of pro there'll be plenty of credit to go around. And if it's bad, who wants the credit? <laughs> and and uh, uh, he, he, I saw him do this, you know. So, uh, somebody on the other side has voted with him and they put something together here that works. When the press is around, he pushes the other person out. He was so helpful on this. He was so helpful, you know. Well, that's what it was. And, and every day I used to get on my bicycle, I'd come in at 7 in the morning. I'd try. I just loved it. <laughs> and because, you know, there's something going on every second, and, and uh, it was fun. It was fun, and we also, that's, he'd give you, me namely, time if you're making progress. He had a pretty competitive staff. And uh, you're not making progress? Goodbye, I'll do something else. That was his view. And you make some progress? Okay. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's not the world I know as it is now, but it was, it was an awfully good time for me. I enjoyed being there. It was really wonderful, and I miss him. And of course, everybody who knew him misses him, everybody. Well, thank you for having helped to create this superb educational institution. And you just said something very interesting. You said if we're going to solve this problem of democracy, people have to look in the mirror. So they have to be guided by reason rather than passion. They have to be educated about the sources of the Constitution. And our job tonight is to talk about the First Amendment. And you have a very important view of the First Amendment that I want you to talk about in a sec. But first, I want you to tell the audience why it is that the Supreme Court, by nearly unanimous majorities, has said, at least ever since the 1960s, that speech can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. Where does that principle come from? And why is it important? Well, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm talking to a group of students, I would say the first thing to remember in this First Amendment, I'm not the world's expert on the First Amendment. You have a few people coming up in a few minutes who are pretty good experts, but we do have cases on it, so I have to know about it. But the, if I say this one principle that, 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 that I want the, the high school students to know, and the grammar school students too, the college students, it really is, at least as it's come to be in the so last hundred years, it's there for people whose speech you don't like. And it's so tempting to say, that's Voltaire, it isn't really Voltaire. You know, Voltaire supposedly said, and I think I tried this once and some expert wrote in and said he didn't really say that. <laughs> but nonetheless, he says, I, I, I can't, I don't like what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. That's a great line, I mean, like many other lines, should have been said. And, and uh, that's the theme. So when the Nazis, even that, my God, the Nazis, you know, uh, demonstrating in uh, Skokie, yeah, 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 even that. And, uh, well, suppose you yell fire in the crowded theater. We know you can't do that. If you're going to solicit a crime, you can't do that. If you're going to go and uh, say something that's going to lead somebody and you know it and want it to go hit somebody else in the face, no. You're talking an idea, you're talking a thought, you're talking, yeah, can that do harm? Yeah, it can do harm. The speech can do harm. Of course it can. But the view that we've had is the greater harm is to put somebody up as a censor to decide when it goes too far. There'll be some, I mean, you have to say with a crowd in the theater, you know, fire in a crowded theater. But, but uh, within the range of viewpoints, we consider that the greater harm. And uh, not every country does. I was in Canada uh, about two months ago, and they were having a discussion of this subject. And in Canada, no, they, they think it's a great idea. You can, in fact, censor hate speech, for example. It goes too far. But then I say, well, I'm not used to that, because that is not our environment. So I start thinking about 
what is the difference between Canada and here? I think this is my imagination. But I think Canada, people agree with each other an awful lot. My mother used to say, you know, there's no view so crazy, there isn't somebody in this country who doesn't hold it. And uh, she, we lived in San Francisco. She said they all live in Los Angeles. But, but, but not, 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 nonetheless, you see the point. And that is, the, uh, I guess, the, the miracle I see in my job every single day. I see people of every possible point of view, every race, every religion, and they've come into a courtroom, uh, and uh, uh, have, that holds them together. They will solve their problems that way. They won't solve their problems by murdering each other. And we want to see the other just turn on the television set. And 320 million people of all kinds of views, oh my goodness. I sat, you know, I, I, I lived in Boston a long time. I grew up in San Francisco. I lived here for 40 years or more. And, and uh, so I didn't go to high school here, which makes me difficult to accept, but, but, <laughs> but, but, but still, but still. Uh, all right, and I'd seen differences, but nothing until I got to Washington. There are differences. I wasn't aware of that, our first reaction. Why doesn't everybody agree with me all the time who am so reasonable? <laughs> but but uh, after a while, I thought that isn't such a terrible thing. It's a very big country. People have very different views. And uh, the important thing is hold them together and this constitution, uh, which I have in my pocket because I use it, people ask about it, it holds people together. And uh, that's great. And one of the things I think that's important is let them say what they want. We don't like it. We'll try to convince them they're wrong. Try to convince them they're wrong. And they are a lot of them. <laughs> but, but still, but still. I mean, that's the theory. So I say, Canada, hey, that's like what Jack Kennedy that suddenly thought of that, he said to Harold Macmillan, and Harold Macmillan at the, at the Blue Streak Missile, they were in uh, Bermuda discussing that when he was first in office, and they were talking about the Blue Streak Missile, and after they're talking together, and Kennedy supposed, uh, Dick Neustadt told me that, so it's probably true. He said, he said to Harold Macmillan, well, what are you gonna do about your budget, just making conversation? He says, well, we're gonna do this and that, and then it'll be this and that, and, and he said, but yeah, but what will Parliament say? And Macmillan said, Parliament? Parliament? He said, we control the majority in Parliament, and they'll do what we say. And Kennedy turned to him and said, well, he said, anyone could run a country like that. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that, that sort of occurred to me as a difference when I was listening to this in Canada. You just said something very important. You mm. said the difference between the US and Canada and Europe also, where hate speech is regulated, is that there people tend to agree, and here we vigorously disagree. And many Supreme Court opinions, including by our mutual hero, Justice Louis Brandeis, have said that in America, the final end of the state is to make people free to develop their faculties, and that in its government, the deliberative forces should prevail over the arbitrary. What has the Supreme Court said about why it's important when people vigorously disagree that the best response to evil words is good words and that counter speech is better than suppression? Well, one, one reason is a very practical reason. If you're going to start suppressing speech, particularly on the basis of the point of view, even if it's a hateful point of view, who's going to do it? You see? And uh, therefore, you risk setting up a board of censors. And I, I rather like the, the two ideas that I put in my opinions, which I've taken from others. I mean, what one is, uh, of course, the marketplace of ideas that we think if you allow every point of view and don't have the censorship, eventually reason will prevail. But I, I did like uh, Newborn's book because he says, well, look at that First Amendment. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a transmission bell. See, first, people think. They can think what they want. That's the religion clauses, which in those days was really ideology and, and was really what you want to think inside your head. And uh, from there you go to speech, which is we express it. And we think about it, and then we express it. And then there is the press, which helps transmit it to other people. And then there is petition, because the point of a lot of this is to get to our public representatives. And then uh, the idea, it's not that that marketplace of ideas is out there just idly spinning away. The idea is for a lot of speech, not all, and not even for all protected speech, but for a lot of speech, the idea is that we will gather people, we will get supporters, we will get our views across in a marketplace which will build a public opinion that will be transmitted into action. Now, I say that is a theory of government. 
And I think for 100 years, it's been our theory of government. And uh, uh, maybe it won't work. That's what I also, it's an experiment. And we hope it will. We hope it will. I mean, you go back into history, we've had a civil war. We've had slavery. We've had uh, segregation. We've had all kinds of things. It's a roller coaster. And what I want the students to understand is you're never, never, are you self-satisfied? You can't be. It's always an experiment. And that's why the founders said that. Washington said that. Lincoln says that at Gettysburg. Read that. Why does he want this war to be won? Because he wants to show the experiment will work. And if the country breaks up, it didn't. And uh, so there we are. I'm just trying to energize them, you see. <laughs> I'm trying to energize them say, hey, hey go, go to the Constitution Center <laughs> and uh, listen to what people are saying and learn something about this heritage. The marketplace of ideas metaphor comes from Holmes. Yes. He was pessimistic about truth prevailing. He was a nihilist. He thought the strong should crush the weak through words. Brandeis was more idealistic that given the chance to hear all points of view, reason would prevail. Which are you in your theory of free speech? Optimistic or pessimistic? I'm always optimistic because there isn't much of a choice. <laughs> I mean, my, my father, who's rather a pessimist, would say, it's nice to be a pessimist because you're always pleasantly surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think you have to be optimistic about it. And I just, two out, three hours ago, I was in Washington talking to a group of students from New York, many of whom were Muslim women. And they're in some special program. And they're not all there from a lot of different places. And, and, I, and again, I did refer to Senator Kennedy. And I, I said, well, what do you learn? You, and just Arthur Goldberg, whom I was clerk for, uh, keep going. I mean, Goldberg used to say that. He'd say, he'd, uh, keep going. I mean, you, you get depressed. You get gloomy. You say, I'm never going to. Well, what's your choice? You say, oh, how awful. Or you keep going. And, and that was uh, Arthur Goldberg's view. Just keep going. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. And I think that was Kennedy's view. Keep going. And uh, that's where I say, uh, I, and sometimes I don't like that because it's so depressing when I'm feeling depressed. But then I think of that and I say, hey, come on. <laughs> come on. We just keep going. Good. You're like Brandeis, optimistic. Given time, reason will prevail. Now, you have a very distinctive approach to the First Amendment. And it's unlike any of your colleagues. And I want you to set it out. Now, you have argued that the value of speech should be balanced against its social costs, and that rather than being categorical, judges should be reasonable. Tell us more about what that balancing. That is not framework. my view of speech. And number first thing you learn in that place, if you say, I'm the only one who has it, I'm sunk. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the point is that people are interested in is not the Constitution according to me or according to Sandra O'Connor or someone else. What they're interested in and should be interested in is what's the court's view. And uh, the court has a, it doesn't settle completely in every area. I, I would say that, that, that what I th think in terms of the cases that I've had to read and go back and read it over history, that I find, you, you know, that there is, a, and this is so much a question of temperament, it really isn't really a question of politics. There are those who want clear rules. And in questions, there are many, many issues that come in front of us where the real question, which no text tells us, no answer to this is given in a treatise. But how, how rule-based are you? How long-term do you decide the issue? How much do you write it based on these facts? How much do you write it sort of hesitant? And I'm more in the hesitant school, because I think life is a mess. And you go and uh, 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 write to something too definite for the indefinite future, it'll come back and hit you in the face. So probably that was one of the big differences where I would differ with Nino Scalia. It was that he likes rules. He's happier with rules. He wants a black letter rule. I don't. I mean, sometimes I do, because you have to sometimes. But I'm, I'm more on the careful. Uh, it'll come and hit you in the face. So th that is uh, the kind of problem that people have in terms of their attitude. So in free speech, we'll say, well, there are, uh, you know, there are, there are three levels of speech. Uh, there is like political speech, and uh, that really gets strong protection. And there's commercial speech, which gets medium protection. And uh, 
There is uh, uh, economic regulatory speech, where you're trying to regulate uh, natural gas or something, and so you tell them how, how much, that, what they have to say in the uh, bill that they send to the customer. All right, Brandeis would have said that gets the lease protection. No, I think that's right. But beware of that. I will treat them more like a stop sign, green, yellow, red. And you say, well, that doesn't tell you too much. I know what a stop sign is, but it doesn't say anything. I say, exactly, exactly. They're just telling you be cautious, or be very cautious, or, hey, let the legislature alone. But then they spin off other rules, and I get nervous about those. So I probably, and others will do this too, I'm sure John Stevens did, was exactly in the same kind of mode, and uh, so is uh, uh, Drew. They're all people of this to some degree. <coughs> Probably Ruth is to some degree. You'd have to read through a lot of her opinions to know. It's a temperamental question, a question of temperament. But I, say, I think in the tough cases that we have, you're not going to get too far through this classification. And you're going to have to end up doing something that in one form or another, we do. We call it, first you look to, I can't, you know, like, like the four part test. Okay. Call it a four-part test. I say what they're doing when they say a four-part test or a three-part test, particularly in the speech area, is what people are doing, what the judges are doing, is they're sitting there and saying, what reason is there for trying to regulate this? Is the reason because you, you want to, uh, uh, you think by regulating what the physician or what the druggist can tell the, the uh, pharmaceutical company, you will produce lower prices? Is the reason you're regulating it because there's a national emergency? And you think that uh, you don't want people uh, sending messages to terrorists or something? I mean, what's your reason? And then when you see the reason, you look to see uh, how much does it hurt speech? I mean, maybe it's just a side issue of the speech. That isn't what they're regulating. And are there less restrictive alternatives? That's the kind of questions that go into a form of balancing. Call it whatever you want. Call it applying rules, but I don't think it really is. I think a lot of the time judges are sitting there trying to figure out what the underlying uh, problem is, what the underlying uh, issues are, cutting in different directions, and then being very aware of the need for this First Amendment to uh, particularly protect political speech and certain other and where it's idea-based, and the lesser need where what you're trying to do is regulate drug prices. Well, we can call it a pragmatic approach because that's what it is. And you've just described the Sorrell case involving drug prices and pharmaceuticals, and you described your position, and you were in the dissent. And your colleagues in the majority wanted a more categorical approach and said that commercial speech was protected. You were concerned that a more categorical approach for commercial speech might lead to the court striking down all sorts of other economic regulations down the line. Tell us about that. It's not just that. economic. I mean, I. Uh... Well, Sorrell is an interesting case because what it was uh, was the following. Uh, the state of Vermont thought that drug companies who will go to pharmacists and find out from the pharmacist what drugs are being described, prescription drugs, by different doctors in the state then will know how to send their salesman to these doctors, knowing that the doctor is using uh, prescription drug number X. And they say, oh, wouldn't you like to try Y? You see, which is ours. And it's patented. And they thought that that was a cause for raising prices. Well, naturally, the way I've been brought up in the law, I would think that's a good reason. Nothing wrong with that. And does it hurt speech? Very little. It hurts the pharmacists, uh, uh, I mean, a little bit, but not much. And is there a less restrictive way of doing it? I couldn't think of one, and nor could the briefs, at least in my view. So I said, fine, it's OK. It's OK. That's a commercial reason. It's, a, it's a, an economic reason. And therefore, it's OK. Now, my colleagues did not agree with that. And I think Brandeis would have agreed with it. Now, we both like Brandeis. <laughs> so he, he, and I think that's what he would have said. And, and uh, uh, so it's very dangerous uh, to use these rules if these rules are going to end up uh, dismantling, this is what I said in the opinion, uh, economic regulation. Because it's important for the government to be able to regulate. And all human life is carried on through speech, including regulation. 
So you have to have some distinctions there. But uh, that was what I wrote in that opinion. I have to say, uh, to justify my, so the same, just about the same day, there was a case involving an anti-terrorism act, and the anti-terrorism act said that you cannot give aid to a terrorist. And a terrorist was defined as a person or group on a list that the Secretary of State keeps. And uh, the question was a retired administrative law judge wanted to help the Kurds uh, who were on that list, their group, uh, by teaching them how peacefully to petition the United Nations. Well, I thought that's protected by the First Amendment. See, applying the same kind of system. But my colleagues, a majority, did not. I don't know how helpful that is. <laughs> You'll get more from the panel. It's extremely helpful, and it also reminds us uh, about a case that I know everyone uh, is uh, eager for your thoughts about, and that is Citizens United. You were in dissent in Citizens United, and you think Brandeis would have been too. Tell us why you think it was wrong and what the consequences are. Well, it's, it's not just first people use Citizens United as a symbol for the court's reluctance or the striking down of campaign finance laws. In my own opinion, the later case of McCutcheon goes much further. I mean, it's, it's uh, it, it, where I did dissent in greater length. But, but I, I think that the, the Citizens United really was about whether labor unions and corporations uh, can be forbidden to contribute to a candidate uh, appearing on television in the last few months of the campaign. Uh, you see, when, uh, when other people can do it or can't do it, well, special rules for labor unions and corporations. And the, the majority said, no, you can't have these special rules. I thought you could have these special rules. OK, so there we are. But the more important one is the later one of McCutcheon. And I'd say the more important one, too, is a sentence in Buckley versus Vallejo in 1974 upholding campaign finance regulation. But it says you cannot regulate in one sentence. It seems to say that you cannot regulate independent expenditures. Well, it seems to be a problem we're facing now, where you have on both sides of the aisle people who are billionaires and they don't give the money directly to the candidate. They run it themselves. So I'd say those are all problems. And uh, I've been on the side where I think campaign finance laws are OK. But it's important to know that there's a good argument on the other side. So what do the people think who think they're not OK? First, they do not think it's a good idea to say, well, it's about money, not speech. I say, oh, you mean it's about money? Really? Not about speech? So you can regulate it? You try running a political campaign without money. Try it. Yeah, I haven't ever heard of you. <laughs> and nor will anyone else. <laughs> so if you want your ideas around, you have to have money. So they say, of course it's part of speech. Of course it is in that context. Then they appeal to the same idea that I believe Learned Hand had, which was don't get into the business of trying to say how much money is too much or how much speech is too much. And uh, I think he did tell that to Ronnie Dworkin, who was his law clerk. And he used to say that. Now, why not? Because he said they'll outwit you every time. You see what Congress does with these. They'll write themselves into office. And you won't even know. And you, you, you know, they're, they're not stupid, and they, they, will, they will do it. Don't get into that business. And if you're going to say how much campaign finance money is too much, you're in it. You're in that business. So I, I mean, that's not, those are not bad arguments. And, uh, but I don't want to convince you they're right, <laughs> because actually I was on the other side. <laughs> and so the, the argument the other way, which um, is, look, you have somebody giving $5 and then somebody else gives $5 million? Are you kidding? I mean, who's the person who is going to get the access to the politician? Who's the one who's going to be in his office when it comes time to vote? And what's going to happen to the $5 contributor? Forget it. I mean, forget it. And yet the purpose of the First Amendment is, in part, 
to allow people who have ideas and want to support the Republicans or the Democrats through their speech and through the money that enables speech to transmit the idea so that it has an impact on the government. So it isn't purely theoretical. So how can you start saying the $5 million man can do it and the $5 man can't do it, please? So I'll tell you to me, hey, you're in the business of saying how much is too much. I see you're right, you're right. Is that a great business? No. I had to say in the Vermont case, I thought there was a limit of $100. That was the maximum contribution. So I, I said, well, gee, for $100, you can't even buy a cup of coffee. And uh, <laughs> you know, Well, you see the idea. I had to say, no, that's too, too low. It's going to write the people who are incumbents into office. How do I know? So, see the problem? But I say the game is worth the candle. Because if you don't do it, you are going to discover that either there won't be a transmission belt for the $5 people, who are the vast majority, or they'll think there isn't, even if there were. And either way, the democratic process is gone and or hurt seriously. And so if you don't have it, if you don't let Congress act, because you say the Constitution prevents it, what are you doing to the basic democracy that that Constitution creates and that the First Amendment is part of? Well, that's my argument, but I want you to see, primarily, that there are two sides to the argument. And I hope also you think my side is correct. <laughs> The court said in Citizens United, we are confident that this decision will have no impact on Americans' confidence in the integrity of American democracy. Was the court wrong? I wrote a dissent. I didn't. I joined the dissent in that case, so obviously I'm going to think they're wrong. <laughs> Doesn't prove they're wrong, but I think it's good evidence. <laughs> well, you're a pragmatist. What has the effect of Citizens United been on America? Well, you tell me. I'm not out there. I'm in this ivory tower. I'm, I'm up there with my. <laughs> A computer and my uh, you know, word processor and these books and briefs and so forth. From what I read, it has not been a happy effect, but that's just one, you know, I have no stand, I have no particularly, people here know more about it than I do. Well, you read the briefs and you mentioned the McCutcheon case. Why was that important and why did the briefs? Because I went it? further, or the majority went further in saying what Congress could not regulate. That's why. Uh, and uh, the, the arguments are, are uh, full, more fully developed. So I found that a more important case and a more interesting case. And it sounds like you would go in the opposite direction and overrule or modify Buckley to say that expenditures as well as contributions may be regulated. Well, that, that's a different, there are many, many things. You know what Congress has enacted in respect to the uh, independent expenditure? Oh. I do know, you want another answer? Yes, very much. Nothing, <laughs> nothing. So first, you'd need a statute. Before you have any question of whether a statute is unconstitutional, there has to be a statute. And there, my, there, there are many ways, there are many ways that you might try other forms of, uh, of uh, regulating campaign expenditures. And I think, but I'm not an expert, that there are also many ways Congress hasn't tried. Ultimately, uh, how important is it for Congress to act? Right now, the, democ the democratic question of the moment is fake news on Facebook. And they're saying it's affected the Brexit vote in the American election. But the Constitution says Congress shall make no law. It doesn't say Mark Zuckerberg shall make no law. So is this not a problem for the courts, but for Congress? And should Congress solve this problem? That's a different question. I mean, is, uh, Congress, it says Congress shall make no law. Then the 14th Amendment says the state shall make no law. And that comes right through. It doesn't say that, but it's been read to be applying to government in general. And, and you are saying that, uh, well, what about a private person? I mean, private persons all the time. Uh, I, can, I can tell my guess, so I don't, but I might tell my children, you're not going to say this at the dinner table. Doesn't do any good, by the way. But nonetheless, uh, 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 private, it, it, it applies to government actors. But it, it does not apply to private actors. And therefore, where, uh, if, if there's a problem with the platforms, will the solution have to come not from the courts, but from Congress or the states or from other regulations? Here you're asking me a question that I have no better an opinion on than any other person in this room. Or even if I did, I wouldn't say it. 
The one thing I did learn, which I don't, but I, I learned working there, is matters for Congress are up to Congress. And above all, and at first, Congress. Second, every other citizen of the United States. And last, me. <laughs> because uh, I can get myself into a lot of trouble seeing what Congress can do and can't do. That's up to them, and it's up to other people to do, decide. Okay, we have to get your jurisprudence and the First Amendment on the table in our remaining time. What are the, uh, you began by saying there's this bipartisan agreement about the importance of protecting hate speech under the First Amendment. Well, I think those, you tell me, you've read the cases. I think if you go back uh, 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 for the last hundred years or so, you will see case after case and holding after holding that says do not discriminate, uh, particularly you can't, don't have a law that discriminates on the basis of the person's viewpoint even though that viewpoint may be very bizarre and very undesirable. Now, don't you think that's what they say? They absolutely say that. All right, that's all I'm saying. However, <laughs> a new series of polls that the Stanton Foundation and the Knight Foundation have commissioned show that undergraduates believe that that's the wrong balance, and that when it comes to a clash between equality and dignity on the one hand, and hate speech and free speech on the other, you should protect dignity rather than free speech. So should the First Amendment be reinterpreted? What I uh, thought was wonderful about what Derek Bach did when he was president of Harvard is uh, some students hung a Confederate flag out the window. And he said, that's childish. It's unpleasant. It is just they're just doing it to show off. And they have a right to do it. OK? Now let me tell you why. And there was a good educational experience there. So I think that's why we have this Kennedy Institute. I think that's why you have the Constitution Center. And that's why I think that's, and most people, I think, and everybody in public life will think that. The, the most important thing we can do is, is uh, uh, teach the next generation and the generation after that. Uh, why? Why these values have developed in this country? And so uh, I, I'm sure whatever it is, uh, you know, th there we are. You have to explain it. And we won't have it. And the, that's what, what, I, what I tell the uh, Duck Lincoln. I tried, my, my, my wife said that she will give each of our grandchildren $20 uh, when they memorize the Gettysburg Address. And uh, yeah, and one's done it. And, and uh, you know, I said, look, the key, the key thing here, that's what I was talking about before. See, think, think of one of the reasons. I can remember it, four, first, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and uh, dedicated to the proposition all men are created equal, everybody. Uh, now we are engaged in that war, to, a great civil war, to see, thank you, <laughs> to see if that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. So when people quote to me that Lincoln might have fought that civil war, even, as he said, if it wouldn't free the slaves, though he certainly wanted to free the slaves, I think, why could he have thought that? And the answer was, if you go back into history and see what did they think they were doing, the founders, they were actually trying to put the Declaration of Independence, those two notions, into practice. And that was an amazing thing then, because they were the only people around doing it. The rest were like kings, you know. And, and, and what they thought of, these sophisticates in England and in France, they thought, oh, it sounds good on paper. It sounds good on paper. Sure, it's brilliant. Those are those uh, professor-like people over in the salons, you know, saying this kind of stuff. And uh, it'll never work. It'll never work. Read what Washington wrote. He wrote letters on this and said, it's an experiment. We want to show them it will work. And we're going to. And Lincoln is thinking, of course, as I, as I said before, if this nation falls apart, those skeptics over there were right. And the experiment didn't work. So that's what I want to say to the students. Hey, it's still an experiment. And you better learn a few things. If you come to this point of view uh, after knowing everything about it, fine. Okay, that's your right. But I'd like you at least to know. <laughs>
a lot more about the history of this country and who lives here and the different views that we have and that we've tried to cooperate and we're trying and you know all that kind of stuff that you learn and used to learn in 12th grade civics and I learned in the fifth grade where we'd have a, a Mrs. Squataguatza would, would, would get five of us in groups of five and we'd have to work on projects together and we'd only get one grade, so you had to listen to what those other kids were saying. And, and uh, uh, yeah, that's right, it's called cooperation, it's tried to get together with uh, all that kind of thing. So they learn all that and stick with their view, okay, I respect it, but not till they learn. What's the story of the First Amendment that you want all Americans to learn? That we are 320 million people who have decided that we are going to get together and run ourselves by ourselves. And to do that, we think it is important that you respect all points of view. Not respect them, but allow them to be expressed, even if they're, my God, that. Because that's better than having somebody up there who's going to tell you what you can say and what you can't. Because human beings who tell you that can make mistakes, too. And before you decide you want somebody up there to stop the people you disagree with, you better start thinking of how would you like somebody up there who thinks you're saying the wrong thing. Because what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. A little corny, but that's the basis of law. <laughs> and uh, uh, there we are. So uh, that's uh, now up to them. And. Um how do we apply this amendment in an age of new technologies? You've written about violent video games, and how, and how can we take the framers' values and put them into the age of Google and Facebook and video games? No, I, please, you know, I'm, I don't know. And those cases come up slowly. And I've learned two things. First, you bring up the video games. That was a law in California that said before a 16-year-old can go in and, and get a triple X violent video game, he has to have his parents' permission. I have to admit, I did think that did not violate the First Amendment. But there we are. My colleagues disagreed. OK. So, 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 so uh, uh, the answer comes, Tocqueville is good on this. And this is how it will be answered. I don't have an answer. But Tocqueville said, and I think it's worth thinking about with these problems of privacy and speech, where they sometimes conflict with problems like the internet. He said, when I come to America, the first thing I do is I'm still on the ship and I hear the clamor. And what he's thinking about is he means everybody's shouting at each other. Well, shouting isn't so good. But his basic point is they're debating everything under the sun. And when we have a new technology like this, go look at privacy. Privacy used to be protected under 20 different areas of the law. And one of the best protections of privacy was called failing memory, which I understand a lot about. And the, 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 the uh, you know, the, you'd see the, they'd see you in the village square, somebody, he'd forget. And uh, that isn't true now. The computer doesn't. The video doesn't. It doesn't forget, and it doesn't forget. And so how, what do we change? Well, Tocqueville is saying the way that people will decide it is they'll start discussing it. They'll discuss it in newspaper articles, in journal articles. We'll have the Bar Association, you know, with its uh, 300,000 members and 500,000 committees. And they, they will go and start talking about it. They'll be the sheriffs, and they'll be the police chiefs, and they'll be the ACLU, and the, there will be teachers' unions, and there will be the this and the that, and they'll start discussing it. And out of this discussion will come all kinds of experimentation. There will be people in different states who try things. There will be people who try administrative rules. Some of those won't work. They'll try something else, and uh, 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 they'll then maybe pass a law. And then it's best when we come in, not, a hundred, not always, but normally it is best when we come in last. And our job is not to say what is the great solution. Our job is to say whether the solution that others have come up with through the legislative process is consistent with this document. And this document, by and large, does not tell people what to do. It creates a framework for government and certain limits. And we have the job of saying, does this exceed the limits? Is it beyond the frontier? 
I used to say our, our job is, uh, it's like uh, what I used to listen to when I was a child. It was called, I think, Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. He would patrol the frontier with Canada and Alaska, and it was cold up there. And sometimes it's difficult, you know, is abortion on this side or is it on that side? But that isn't saying, well, it's just the frontier. And uh, for the most part, it leaves to the democratic process the job of saying, how do we solve problems like yours? Just limits that you can't go and exceed. They'll come in last. Why? Because people have more information. They will have tried different things. We'll have a broader perspective. We will be told by the lawyers. This was tried here, that was tried there, and all those amicus briefs and everything, and parties briefs, they'll, they'll refer us to things. We'll get it. We'll look it up on the internet. <laughs> we can read the articles. And, they shouldn't be called brief, because they're not briefs. <laughs> they're not brief. But anyway, you see, that's the process. So this last question is about the democratic process. And Tocqueville and Madison believed that when citizens engaged in the process you talked about, they would slowly deliberate over time and collect information from different sources, and eventually their views would be reflected in law. But now we govern by tweet and filter bubbles and echo chambers and people are segregating themselves into little enclaves where they're only hearing people who agree with themselves. So how can you be optimistic that the public reason that Tocqueville and Madison thought was necessary for the survival of American democracy can flourish? Well, think of a newspaper. A newspaper was a broker. It put together a staff of journalists and uh, advertisers and a reading public. And there were different newspapers. But basically, what a newspaper was doing was saving me and you time. Because some we grew to trust. And we would say, I'll look at them in the morning. And I'll look at some articles. All right? And uh, uh, I, I trust this editor. So if he puts it right on the top of the front page, I think it's more important. And if he puts it on page 20, less important. And uh, I will, it'll help me save time. No, I say, do you think people in the future won't want to save time? Do you think they won't want to grow trusting more, trusting less? I trust this editorial judgment more. Maybe it'll be on the internet. But there will be names that guide people towards things they respect more. And so if you assume an ed a reasonably educated population, I don't see why eventually we would not have that function served on the internet. I mean, people might get tired of seeing sort of weird things. Uh, I've gotten a little tired of it. <laughs> but maybe they won't, OK? Then the experiment fails. But uh, since I think, you know, I'm pretty optimistic, we'll, I say that to, you know, grandchildren, children, that generation, figure it out. Figure it out. Your generation is going to want to save time, too. Your generation is going to want to have a democracy, too. Your generation is going to want to be more uh, uh, fact-based than just some theory. And uh, so you figure it out. And I don't see why they won't. So of course I'm optimistic. And maybe there isn't much choice about whether you're optimistic or not. But I am optimistic. I don't see why they won't figure it out. And you talk to, talk to some of those groups. You know, I, I'm very biased, but I don't think my grandchildren are so bad. <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, uh, they, uh, I'm very optimistic. And you have your center, and they have this, and there are like 50 other things elsewhere. And we do still have schools, and uh, we, we do uh, uh, come around eventually. And uh, well, OK, I may be stupid, but I'm optimistic about it. What's the, le what's the one thing about the First Amendment you want the audience to read, to learn and educate themselves? And the first thing? Read the text of the First Amendment. <laughs> and then read, you can read your, you've written a book about Brandeis. I mean, read about Brandeis, read about Holmes, read these great opinions, and think about them. That's all. Justice Breyer, for your optimism, your passion, and your dedication to the future of the First Amendment, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Justice Breyer. Breyer. Thank you for being optimistic. Yeah. It's very, yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Passover season, and uh, those of us who celebrate Passover have an expression, die nu, it would have been enough. If we just heard Justice Breyer, die nu, but now we're about to hear another dream team panel about the future of the First Amendment. I am so excited to introduce to you Judd Campbell uh, of the University of Richmond School of Law, who has written an article that the scholar Cass Sunstein has described as the most important article about the original meaning of the First Amendment in a generation. Stephen Solomon, uh, professor of journalism at NYU and author of this wonderful book, Revolutionary Dissent, How the Founding Generation Created the Freedom of Speech, who disagrees in some important respects with Professor Campbell and my old friend and the great defender of civil liberties, Nadine Strassen, John Marshall Harlan, professor of law at New York Law School and author of the forthcoming book, Hate. Please join me in welcoming all of them. Uh, Judd, if I may, I've been so eager to meet you and have learned so much from your extraordinarily provocative and important article. Justice Breyer talked about the Constitution embodying the theory of the Declaration of Independence, and you argue that the natural and unalienable rights that Jefferson believed came from God or nature and not from government included rights of conscience, opinion, and speech, and you believe the fact that the founding generation saw conscience and speech as natural rights meant that many of them believed that those rights could be regulated in the interest of promoting the public good. Tell us more about your thesis about the framers' understanding of speech as a natural right. Thank you. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate uh, and uh, look forward to the conversation. Um, so uh, the first thing to realize is the founders thought about rights very differently. They lived in a different world. They were growing up in a world uh, where constitutionalism was entirely different. Uh, and so when we go back and then we interrogate the historical sources, we have to at least be ready to confront similar words that had different meanings. And I think rights are a great example of that. So the founders, when they were thinking about rights, were dividing rights into two different categories. One was rights that were inherent in our humanity. They were rights given by God. They were things we could do without the assistance of a government. You could speak, you could talk, you could think, you could walk. These are natural rights. Then we also have rights that are given to us by a government. They're rights that require the assistance of the government that disable the government in some way from acting. The right of habeas corpus, the right to a jury. These are rights defined in terms of a governmental institution right to confrontation. These are the sorts of uh, criminal and civil procedural rights that we find in the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th Amendments. And so when we confront a phrase like freedom of speech, my take is that we shouldn't be going back to the sources trying to find all the instances in court cases where they were talking about freedom of speech. While, rather, we can start from a basic analytical framework of natural rights and recognize Freedom of speech, oh, that's something I can do without a government, that's a natural right. And in fact, this is exactly how the founders talked about the freedom of speech. They didn't think of it as a technical legal term, and so they used language like freedom of discussion, freedom of opinion, freedom of the tongue, and so forth. And so then we have to ask, okay, well, what is a natural right? Uh, and it turns out that the idea of natural rights at the founding was much less libertarian than we tend to think about now. Today, we tend to think about natural rights as rights that are in opposition to the government. So that's what makes them natural, is they're defined not in relation to something the government has said. The founders thought about them very differently. These were rights that we hold. They are rights that we control through our own consent or the consent of our representatives. And so natural rights, the natural, inalienable natural rights of life, liberty, and property that the founders insist upon when they're fighting a revolution are not rights that cannot be regulated by a government. Rather, they are rights that cannot be regulated by a government in which they do not have representation and therefore do not consent to the regulation. 
And so the most important thing, the starting point for understanding freedom of speech at the founding is that as a natural right, it's a right that can be regulated in promotion of the public good. Now the founders have a narrower set of understandings of legal rights that were ways in which the regulation of speech or the regulation of the press did not in fact promote the public good. So we have a very well recognized right against press licensing that develops in the late 1600s in England. We have a well recognized right that juries should be in charge of making decisions with respect to sedition prosecutions. That develops especially strong in America in the 1730s. There's a well-recognized right, both in England and America, that you should be able to criticize the government for things that the government does wrong. And so we have fundamental aspects of the freedom of speech that are defined in opposition to claims of the public good. The thing that I want to emphasize, though, is that understanding comes through politics. It's not something that the founding judges would have told us what is or is not in the public good, what forms of governmental regulation would promote the public good. This is something where constitutional principle emerges from political conflict. Thank you so much for that. And ladies and gentlemen, you see the important implications of Professor Campbell's article. He is suggesting that originalists, like just the late Justice Scalia, like Justice Thomas, like Justice Gorsuch, should embrace a less libertarian conception of speech than the one that Justice Breyer said the court has, in fact, embraced, and that the founders would have allowed more regulations than the court has assumed. So it's very important that we debate this provocative claim. Now. Uh, uh, Stephen, if I may, you uh, challenge this claim. In your book, you tell stories of founders making claims about speech, and you tell the story of Madison and the Sedition Acts. And you say that Madison absolutely believed that speech was a natural right that came from God or nature and not from government. But in challenging the constitutionality of the Sedition Act, where the Adams administration tried to put in jail anyone who criticized Adams, but not his Republican Vice President Jefferson, both Madison and Jefferson said that this violated the fundamental ability of the people to challenge their leaders and that speech could only be banned if it was intended to create imminent violence and therefore that this natural rights conception was far more restrictive of what the government could ban than Judd suggests. Tell us more about that. Judd is describing a uh, development of natural law that occurred over many centuries, uh, going back to the Enlightenment uh, through the days in England um, for centuries. It was developed under a system where sovereignty, the power, the fundamental power resided in the government and the people were the subjects. And that's the, this, the, the context in which um, this theory of law was developed. When you get to the founding period, and you, you have the United States Constitution ratified, the system of government that was formed rejected that notion of sovereignty in government and placed sovereignty in the people. And that required certain things, as Madison pointed out. It required that people be able to criticize without being punished. And they had to be confident that they could criticize without being punished, or it would chill speech. And so, they, um, and so they did exactly that um, all through the founding period, um, which we can get to later, I think, in describing uh, sort of the populist protests. Um, but a different idea was afoot. Um, and it took, uh, you, natural law and the, the theories of law don't change overnight. And, uh, but they did start to be changed with Madison's introduction of the amendments in 1789 with his protest against the Sedition Act uh, in the Virginia Report of 1800, probably the greatest libertarian statement uh, defending freedom of speech in American history. I would, I would advise everybody to read it. And um, he talks about the difference in the form of governments. And it was so critical to the American form of government that the people be able to criticize government without fear of punishment. And in, under the English system, 
seditious libel enabled the government to punish critics. Great. Just one more uh, beat on this crucial question. Judd, is your claim that the Madison and Jefferson uh, changed their minds, or that they were outliers, or that uh, they don't represent the uh, settled view of the founding generation, or, or is there some other response? Well, I, I, so there are a couple things to say here. So the first is that there are differences of opinion among Republicans who are responding to the Sedition Act. So Jefferson's position is consistent with the predominant Republican response, which is sedition is subject to prosecution, just not in federal court. You've got to go to state court in order to prosecute sedition. And that is the dominant position that Republicans took. Madison does take a more liberal position. His position, by the way, is not in opposition to the a framework that I just described. His position is to move the level of analysis up. So rather than to ask, is this particular instance of sedition, of trying to deliberately, falsely, maliciously trying to mislead the public about what the government has done, rather than asking, is this speech in the public interest, Madison's move is to ask, is governmental power to restrict speech in this way in the public interest? Madison here is recognizing that governmental power is often abused. And so it's important when we're thinking about the public good and what actually does or does not promote the public good, not just to focus on a particular case, but to focus on whether or not in the run of cases a certain type of power will be better served by just denying it entirely. And so that move to raise the level of abstraction is not to abandon the theory, the basic framework of natural rights that underpinned Madison's introduction of the First Amendment in 1789 when he said some of these amendments are recognitions of natural rights, not positive rights, such as speech and conscience. And so I want to embrace that move. That is an acceptable move to say, we are pursuing the public good, not because this speech is proscribable, uh, is not proscribable, not because this speech is in promotion of the public good or not, but rather because we're going to assess, is a governmental power over a certain type of speech in promotion of the public good. What I want to emphasize is Madison was on the democratic politics side of the debate over the Sedition Act. The Federalist position was it is the responsibility of judges to tell us what the Constitution means. When we're asking what is or is not in the public good, we look to the artificial reason of the common law. This goes back to Edward Cook's famous statements in the early 1600s. And so the Federalists were the ones who were trying to equate First Amendment constitutional meaning with what judges were saying about freedom of speech. So Madison's move is directly contrary to that to say, look, this is our document, the public's document. It is up to us to make arguments about what sorts of governmental powers are or are not in promotion of the public good. And Steve, last response on this crucial point. Madison does say when he agrees uh, to support a Bill of Rights that it will inform the people's decision to respect freedom of speech, not be primarily enforced by judges. Jefferson, by contrast, at one point stresses judicial enforcement. Your remarkable stories in this really great book, beginning with this jury that nullified the sedition prosecution of John Peter Zenger and ending with Madison, has lots of stories of juries uh, doing what Judd says they should do. Is your uh, counter, uh, what's, your, what's your counter to, to Judd when it comes to judicial enforcement of the First Amendment? Well, I want to address the, the, the very large question about protecting freedom of speech and freedom of the press until the legislature makes a determination that it's not for the public good. I don't know what the role of the First Amendment is if the legislature has the freedom to do that. I, this afternoon, uh, went to the Constitution of China. And they have a very nice provision, I think it's Article 35, which says you have freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of association, 
And then if you read down, there's another clause that says, except, it's a very big except, hmm. if it, you know, if, if it, it, it's not in a public good, if, it's, if, it, if it, it's not an interest of the state. So you're ascribing uh, founders' intent to a system in which, um, uh, like China, where you can take that kind of opening, it's a very big opening, and drive a lot of suppression, repression, and everything else into, the, uh, in, in, into uh, legislation. I don't know what stands in the way of that if everything is in a public good. Right. Okay, we'll continue this yeah. great debate in, uh, as we proceed, but we must bring in Nadine. Uh, Nadine, your book, Hate, is, I think, the most concise, eloquent, and passionate case for why it's urgently important to protect hate speech uh, that I've read. So congratulations on it. I want you, to, of course, to tell the audience why you think that the protection of the thought we hate is so important. Is it based on a claim about the original understanding of the framers, or are you not interested in this debate between Judd and Stephen and making other arguments and tell us what they well, are? Well, I think it's a fascinating argument, so it's unfair to say I'm not interested, but I make a different argument which is based on both Supreme Court jurisprudence about what free speech is protected, and as Justice Breyer said, uh, the, despite all of the disagreements on this court over and many closely divided votes on many constitutional law issues, the court has really been almost unanimous uh, all the way across the ideological spectrum on what Justice Brennan many years ago called the bedrock principle of our free speech jurisprudence, and it's what Justice Breyer referred to as the concept of viewpoint neutrality. Sometimes it's called content neutrality. That government may never suppress speech merely because the community or government officials uh, dislikes or disapproves of the idea the viewpoint, the message, the content, no matter how deeply loathed by how many, an uh, overwhelming majority of the community, that is never a justification for censorship. Uh, for a number of reasons, one having to do with individual liberty, but another one very much having to do with democracy. How can we, the people, really be the governors, as the opening words of the Constitution proclaim, unless we have the ability to engage in wide-ranging expression of opinions about, especially about, and here I agree with Justice Breyer and, and the rest of the court, that uh, so-called political speech, speech about public issues, really has to be unfettered. And hate speech, I, I have to use air quotes because it is not a constitutional law term of art, precisely for the reason that the court never has defined a category of speech based on its message uh, and said speech that satisfies this, this definition is going to be categorically unprotected. To the contrary, in case after case after case, uh, the court has protected messages that are deeply hated and loathed. Now, in my book, I also make a, an argument based on equal protection concerns and pragmatic and policy concerns because the reason that is usually given for censoring hate speech, and uh, I'll stop the air quotes, please imagine them, just remember it's not a constitutional law term of art, but most people use it to refer to speech that conveys hateful or discriminatory ideas, uh, particularly based on race, religion, uh, uh, so forth, sexual orientation. Uh, and the rationale that is brought forward as uh, supporting censorship of hate speech just because we do loathe its ideas, and certainly as a civil libertarian human rights advocate, I, I hope this goes without saying, I loathe those discriminatory ideas. Uh, but it is not an effective way to counter hateful ideas, much less hateful 
actions by suppressing the speech. And in my book, I give many examples drawing upon the experiences of other countries, most other uh, modern democracies, as well as, as other kinds of countries, do suppress hate speech. And for all of the challenges that we still face in this country in advancing equality, in countering uh, discrimination, uh, discriminatory conduct, and violence, uh, we have actually done a lot better than other countries which do stifle hate speech uh, to the extent that many human rights advocates in these other countries are saying we ought to move more in the direction of the United States. And if I could say one thing, uh, more thing before I end, Jeff. Jeff has only been giving the very provocative main title yes. of my book, which is Hate. Uh, but the subtitle, which the book designer literally chose the constitutional font, which I thought was, was very clever, the subtitle is Why We Should Resist It with free speech, not censorship. So I certainly am calling for resisting uh, and opposing and responding to and arguing against and fighting against the reviled ideas that are conveyed by hate speech, but it should be through raising our voices, through organizing, through advocating, through legislation that outlaws actual discriminatory conduct and violence, but not by trying to stifle ideas, which will just be amplified and those who have them will gain more sympathy uh, if we try to make them into free speech martyrs. Thank you for that passionate and eloquent account of the book, and I would love you to tell the audience why it is that you think that other countries that have attempted to regulate hate speech in the name of equality have ended up harming marginalized groups, LBGT uh, groups, ethnic minorities, and so forth. It is a pragmatic argument, and it also takes the argument of those who would invoke equality to restrict speech and turns it on its head. You know, to just give one example, and the book gives many, uh, Jeff mentioned LGBT rights. So there was recently a case in France which has some of the strictest uh, criminal anti-hate speech laws in, in, the, in the world. Uh, where the head of a uh, LGBT rights group in, in France was uh, criminally sentenced. Fortunately, she did not receive a prison sentence, but a very steep fine, which could be of bankrupting proportions for a public interest organization, because she dared to use the word homophobe to describe the head of an anti LGBT rights organization, and that was considered hate speech against the person whose ideas she rejected, and their book is filled with many other examples. So what, if you think, well, I as a progressive hate, uh, you know, anti-gay ideas, anti-misogyny uh, and so forth, yes, some of those ideas will be punished, but so too will be your ideas, especially if they are advocating on behalf of minority group rights. And, they, and the reason for that flows from the premises of those who advocate hate speech laws. They argue that we still have discrimination in this country. I'll come back to the United States. Of course we do. Uh, not only do we have structural, systemic, bias, as has been documented, unfortunately, in the criminal justice system, also in the civil justice system. But many studies indicate that each of us as an individual is not immune from so-called implicit or unconscious bias. How could we be? We are products of this culture and this society. So therefore, because I do accept those premises, it seems to me that the last thing we would want to do is hand over to the majoritarian uh, power structure the existing criminal justice and civil justice system, uh, those who are elected by and accountable to majorities, to hand over to them this inherently subjective power to decide which speech is sufficiently hateful, right? That's a very subjective and uh, discretionary concept. We should not be surprised that that power would be exercised in a way that is hardly favorable to minority groups, to uh, dissident, dissenting individuals. And so the overall pattern in other countries that have these laws 
over time is that it is the unpopular views that are suppressed, it's the marginal and vulnerable, marginalized and vulnerable individuals, and it's the relatively powerless societal groups that disproportionately bear the brunt of censorship. Wonderful. All right, well, let's integrate this crucial discussion. Judd, what we've you, you, we, we, seem, we, we all agree the framers thought that speech and opinion were natural rights that came from God or nature and not from government. They disagreed about who should enforce regulations on speech, uh, juries and the people or uh, judges. But there was also disagreement about how to define speech that threatened the public interest. Brandeis, when he said speech could only be banned if it was intended to and likely to cause imminent violence, quoted Jefferson's uh, first inaugural and Jefferson's letter to Elijah Boardman, the Connecticut preacher. Is it fair to say that some framers, like Jefferson and Madison, believed that the public interest should be defined so narrowly that speech could only be banned if it was intended to and likely to cause violence, or is that not an originalist position? Well, there are, there are differences of opinion at the founding over precisely what is or is not in the public interest, what sort of policies uh, will pursue uh, uh, good outcomes in particular cases, and in the aggregate, in the long run of cases. Um, if you want to take the idea that the First Amendment creates uh, a general principle of regulating speech in the public interest, except for in those situations where we recognize through political conflict or through uh, some recognition, a uh, 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 political process, that there is no public interest in giving, giving the governmental power uh, over this type of speech, you could learn from the lessons of history. Right? You aren't necessarily hamstrung to what the founders themselves thought about questions of this sort. And so the arguments that Nadine is making very much resonate with me. These are arguments about is governmental power over this type of speech productive of good social consequences or in the aggregate actually harmful? That's exactly the sort of debate we should be having. That's a debate that illustrates what's at stake as a question of public policy. It's not a question of rights in the sort of rigid, deterministic, originalist, or uh, libertarian sense. It's a question of public policy. And so when we think about this question, we ought to be defending libertarian views of free speech on the merits. We ought to make arguments for why having a libertarian conception of free speech is necessary to achieve socially productive consequences. We shouldn't be cutting off debate by just saying the First Amendment says freedom of speech. That's the end of the story. Man. That's exactly the sort of thing that cuts off debate in other areas. It cuts off debate in the Second Amendment context. It cuts off debate in the freedom of association context. As soon as you claim a right in modern America, you are trying to stifle a discussion about public policy. And that's the sort of thing that I think history can help us with. I don't think history answers the question that Nadine is discussing. I think this is the sort of thing we need to confront on our own terms exactly as Madison would have had it. We need to be thinking about what sort of regulations of speech are the sorts of regulations that we as a democratic people want to have. May I make a comment? Because I think uh, you know, the educational function that the National Constitution Center wonderfully is engaging in in this process is really does have to grapple, just as a strategic and educational matter, with these questions of, is there a specific justification in terms of public policy concerns uh, for, uh, even beyond the principles, right, uh, for protecting a certain kind of speech? Because what we are hearing on college campuses, among other uh, sources, is students' understandable unwillingness to accept some kind of doctrine, right, that uh, free speech is protected because it's always been protected. And by the way, I would say that just because uh, if original intent did support that conclusion, I think that a lot of young people today would find that an equally, if I may say so, sterile and unpersuasive justification. I think we have to persuade them that it is 
in the public interest, and that in particular, it is in support of the concerns that they are advancing in terms of social justice. So I think in terms of the educational function and the persuasive function, these are very important arguments. Yes, and panels like this are part of that educational function, and by distributing them uh, on platforms across the country, we are going to bring them to students across America. But persuading judges is important too, and that's why, Steve, your response is so urgently important. Uh, the originalist community is waiting at your feet. You argue in this book that the cases that the founding generation confronted, which were often decided by juries, some of whom nullified and also by judges, did assume a judicial enforceability to the First Amendment and did have judges define the public interest pretty narrowly not to allow regulation of speech merely because it was offensive. So tell us more about what these actual historic cases can tell us in response to Judd. Sure. Well, I, I think um, before you get to the cases, you have to look at, um, you have to go beyond what Judd says or the, or the founders because if you look at the originalist view of what the First Amendment means, you have to go beyond the founders. Not all the founders were in agreement. Um, you have to look at what a reasonable person thought that their rights were at the time. And the, 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 the reasonable people would include not just the elite of society, but many others. I mean, the working class people. And when you, when you talk about that, um, you, can, you can go to uh, John Adams and his correspondence with, with Thomas Jefferson, and they were asking, going back and forth, what, what was the meaning of the revolution? And Adams said, um, the revolution didn't occur at Lexington and Concord when, when drops of blood were shed. If you want to understand the revolution, look at how public opinion was changed in the decade before blood was shed. He said, look to the newspapers, look to the pamphlets, look to uh, the colonial legislatures, and, and, and so on. So when you look at that, you see a different picture, I think, than what, what Judd has been um, explaining about the founders and, and natural law. Adams knew something about this. He was a Bostonian. And this is where the protests started, not far from here. Um, in, in, in Boston, about a mile south of, of the common, 1765 in August, there, uh, the, the, they were, uh, the Parliament had passed the Stamp Act, the infamous Stamp Act, and people like James Otis Jr. and some other pamphleteers were uh, writing these heavily, deeply argued uh, treatises, you know, going back into English history, some of the history that, that we've been talking about here, natural law, the English Bill of Rights, Magna Carta, and uh, that was all well and good, but they also understood, Adams understood this, Otis understood this, that they were not going to persuade Parliament to change and, and, and get rid of the, the Stamp Act unless they broadened public opinion, if they popularized protest. And so what did they do? They reached down uh, to a working class guy named Ebenezer McIntosh, shoemaker, and he put together a protest, a liberty tree uh, in Boston, hanging effigies of the British Prime Minister, the stamp tax collector, and the devil. And for the people who didn't understand the pamphlets and all those deep arguments about natural law, coming out and seeing those effigies swinging in the wind really meant something. It represented oppression. And from there it exploded up and down the coast I mean, from Boston to Savannah, there were liberty trees and liberty poles and effigies, and then people were, you know, they were writing songs, they were writing verse, um, ministers from the pulpit. Protest was popularized. And the common understanding of what their rights were was that they could go out. It wasn't subject to a legislature telling them they couldn't do that. In fact, that's what they were protesting against. It was against Parliament that was throwing people like John Wilkes into jail for, for writing uh, criticism of the king. These stories are so persuasive. What Steve, Stephen tells in his book, in Boston, you say, 
there were 16,000 people in Boston, 2,000 of them took to the streets to protest their rights of free speech. That's how much people cared about these matters. And when James Otis denounced the writs of assistance on the Boston Common, John Adams said, at that moment, the child revolution was born. So it is meet and proper that we are here in Boston discussing these issues. And Judd, is, this is consistent with your story, that the people rising up are allowed to define what the public interest is? And do you agree with Stephen that during the revolution there was a libertarian upswurge of the people uh, in defense of robust right to criticize public officials, well, or does he have that history wrong too? Well, I think, it's, I think it's important to note that we're doing two different types of history. And so uh, S Steve's history is very much a sort of sociology of founding era political activism. Uh, it's a uh, gripping story, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's different than studying the intellectual history of founding era elites, the sort of elites who drafted uh, the First Amendment, who passed it in the first Congress, who were in the legislatures who enacted it. Um, I don't, as a historian, have an account for whose views matter. I can just tell you what uh, I've learned from reading and uh, it, it, how we actually come to incorporate that into modern constitutional law uh, is a question for constitutional theorists to grapple with. I do think that it's hard if we want to look to the sorts of sources that Steve is talking about, because we find a lot of complexity. So these very people who are uh, out there on the streets of Boston defending free speech are also raiding the loyalist printer's office, burning the loyalist printer's property, uh, raiding the uh, royal tax collector's office, assaulting the royal tax collector. And so we have a, a very complex history here, including, including suppression of loyalist speech. Right? The revolutionaries are engaged in suppression of loyalist speech. Uh, and so I think that makes it, that makes it challenging uh, to come to grips with what is when we just go out in the world and we see a bunch of things happening, some of those things are lawless, what is the principle there? And I don't want to uh, discount uh, the popular activism that's giving rise to a lot of uh, founding era debates, but I do want to resist the notion, the notion that the people who are writing and ratifying the First Amendment are thinking about the legal question in those terms. I think they're thinking about the question more in a sort of theoretical framework of social contract theory, thinking about natural rights, thinking about its connection to common law legal rulings. And so there is determinate legal content, to get back to what Steve was talking about, Congress shall make no law. Surely that's a restraint on the legislature, and it is a restraint on the legislature. Those aspects of expressive freedom that through political controversy come to be understood as having foundational status, the rule against prior restraints, the rule that juries have to decide the verdict, not give special verdicts, that allow judges to make rulings. The rule that people can criticize the government in good faith without being prosecuted. Those are the sorts of things that were determinant limits on Congress. And we can add to the list. There's nothing in the First Amendment that prevents us through new understandings of constitutional principle along the lines of uh, Nadine's comments to recognize new constitutional fundamental principles. What is critically important about the 20th century is we have now given that responsibility to judges. So I'm not here to protest that, but I do think it's a dramatic difference from the way that the founders thought about this question. Nadine, let us focus squarely on the question. Justice Breyer raised it initially, and now it's uh, immediately joined, persuading the people to agree with you that it's urgently important that uh, hate speech be protected. This is an age of filter bubbles, echo chambers. The MIT Media Lab recently found that people are more likely to share fake news on Facebook than they are real news. And the real responsibility for the dissemination of fake news is not just uh, Cambridge Analytica, but us. So how, in the age of Twitter and Facebook, uh, can you persuade people 
to read and agree with your book and rather than be guided by uh, passions and polarization and unreason. So why to persuade people to read my book? Uh, <laughs> because I think that it will persuade people who are deeply concerned about any political issue, about any public policy issue, that your good, your public interest is better served by the existing free speech jurisprudence, that you are more likely to persuade people to persuade to join you in your causes, that you are more likely to persuade government officials to enact policies that you support if robust freedom of speech continues to be protected, sufficiently robust to extend to ideas that are hated and people who are members of minority groups. Throughout our history, those who have advocated for law reform, those who have opposed uh, slavery and then opposed Jim Crow and now are opposing um, discrimination and discriminatory police practices, among others, against racial minorities, all of these causes, all law reform causes, have depended on freedom even, indeed, especially for the idea that we hate, to quote Justice Holmes. And that's why, and here I, again, the Boston um, uh, setting is, is relevant. I think of the famous free speech address that was made by Frederick Douglass, the great formerly enslaved individual, great emancipation uh, abolition advocate, who famously defended free speech when his attempt to hold an anti-slavery abolitionist meeting was shut down or attempted to be shut down here in Boston. And he's not alone. Uh, a professor at the University of, of Pennsylvania recently said that it is no co coincidence that every champion of racial justice in our history, including also W.E.B. Du Bois, Martin Luther King, that every single one of them has also been a warrior for freedom of speech. On the Supreme Court, uh, most people think, understandably, of Justice Thurgood Marshall, the first African American on the Supreme Court, as a great champion of racial justice, and indeed, among other accomplishments, he was part of the team that litigated and won Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, but he is also revered as a great champion of free speech, especially the viewpoint neutrality principle. Uh, no coincidence, because civil rights demonstrators depended on that. That's why Martin Luther King wrote his famous letter from a Birmingham jail because his ideas were hated and seen as dangerous and even hateful uh, by those he was challenging. Uh, beautifully said. Um, I'm opening your book, Stephen, to the chapter on Governor William Cosby of New York, which call, who uh, came as governor, uh, was accused of corruption, of taking money from foreign sources. When a judge ruled against him, he fired the judge. Uh, and then uh, he uh, set up uh, a state newspaper to support his authoritarian efforts, and uh, uh, the opposition paper was attacked for seditious libel. I want to ask you as a historian an urgently serious question. It's the one I asked Justice Breyer at the end, and he was, he was optimistic. But it would be great if people read Nadine's book and listened to her um, reasoned arguments. But this is a time where people are more likely, as Justice Breyer suggested, to watch cat videos than to read serious books about the First Amendment. It took, in the old days, a tyrant coming to New York and threatening people's liberty to get thousands of people to rise up in the street. Can you imagine similar mass mobilization on behalf of the importance of criticizing uh, the government today? And what would it take to create that movement? I think you just saw that. I mean, students walking out of schools uh, protesting the government's regulation or non-regulation of guns, uh, an important public policy. Um, the Women's March um, a year ago, uh, a week after 
uh, Trump's inauguration. So I think these things are going on, these mass rallies, these mass protests in the street. I think people are energized on a lot of issues, and they see their rights of expression as being really robust. I'm, I'm very optimistic about that. Um, and the fact that young people, teenagers, can put together um, these mass protests and speak so eloquently about something that, that is so important to them, whether you agree with them or not, that is a good thing in America. They, you know, they are, they, they may not have studied freedom of speech, but somehow it's, it's in the genetics, you know? I mean, the Stamp Act protests of 1765, not much different than what happened last week. That mass outpouring to, to influence government policy and understanding that that's their right. It's their right. They don't need permission. They need a parade permit, things like that, but it's nobody's right to tell them it's not in the public good to be out there. Um, we're sitting in the Senate chamber. Is the Senate and is the House and is government today as likely to reflect those mass protests as it was in the time of the framing, or have there been changes in our politics with polarization and so forth that have made our institutions unresponsive? This is neither of your field, especially Nadine or Judd, but can either of you offer some thoughts on that question? Well, I, I do think the founding was more divided than we often give it credit for. There's uh, bitter divisions at the founding over fairly foundational things. Uh, religion and politics being two of the primary ones, uh, foreign affairs being another. Um, the one thing that I, I will say uh, uh, that gives me optimism is uh, the energy for making our democracy better. The one thing that gives me pessimism is that it seems very difficult to uh, make progress on that. Uh, and if anything, there's a, a sense that we're sliding. And one of the things uh, that I think is important to note about how we think about free speech today uh, is that in the 1950s and 60s, uh, it was imperative to give the Supreme Court more power um, because there was not a fair take on any uh, public policy question involving civil rights in the South. And, and so in cases like New York Times versus Sullivan, or uh, the Alabama uh, X. Rail Patterson case involving the NAACP, the court doesn't use race as the basis for invalidating restrictions of speech, but the court knows what's going on. It's important for the court to elevate the importance of speech in that climate because we deeply distrust those who are restricting speech in that environment. I think one of the reasons why we have given so much power to judges today is because we so deeply, deeply distrust politicians. Uh, and I don't have a statement of hope on that, but I think that is uh, lamentable. I think that one way, one way of making better policy choices in this way, area would be to try and reform our politics. And one of the negative byproducts of the reinvigoration of free speech, as we've seen it play out, is that it, the Supreme Court now stands as a barrier to that. It's very difficult because as soon as you regulate politics, which invariably involves the regulation of speech, you cut off any opportunity for democratic experimentation. Uh, and so th this is not an area where I have hope. I think we're, we're in a real bind. In order to try to make politics better, we may have to uh, take some of the air uh, out of judicial review, uh, and I think that's uh, dangerous. I think that poses its own, its own threats today. And so uh, this is an area, I don't have any solutions here, but I think we face a, a sort of a historical moment of, uh, of, of real problem. Well, we're about to, I'm going to give you the last word, Nadine. We're about to take a really important vote, so I want everyone to prepare for it. And that is namely, uh, do you believe that the First Amendment should be construed to protect hate speech? That's what you're going to have to uh, vote on.
Nadine, you're going to have the last word. You can make the closing argument for why you think it should, but I know you are one of the distinguished civil libertarian liberals who believes, uh, unlike Justice Breyer and uh, Judd, that Citizens United was correctly decided. So tell the audience why you think that the government uh, should not be able to regulate campaign spending as well as hate speech, and why a completely unregulated marketplace of ideas is so crucially important for the future of American well, democracy. Well, I'm not saying completely unregulated, right? Um, and, and that's an important point that Justice Breyer touched on, that th these are not um, binary questions, right? Not black and white. There are nuanced positions. And one of the things I learned in researching my book is that hate speech may be suppressed in certain contexts if, and this is the test that uh, Jeff discussed with Justice Breyer many times, if but only if it creates what's often called a clear and present danger. So if it does constitute a true threat or if it does constitute targeted harassment, then it can be suppressed. And I think that's exactly right. Uh, with respect to uh, spending money to advocate ideas on issues, which is the particular regulation that was at issue in Citizens United, uh, I think more harm than good was done by that law. Again, I'm looking at the pragmatics uh, as well as the principle uh, because it functioned as, and Justice Breyer alluded to this, an incumbent's protection act. Are we really going to trust those who are in power to pass laws that's going to make it easier to unseat them? Of course not. So we should not be surprised that these laws set financial limits that are protective of incumbents. Now let me get back to the point about issue advocacy, which was what was at stake. The ACLU what, uh, well, well, let me give you this example. Uh, the ACLU, by our own corporate charter, never advocates for or against the election of any official. That's just inconsistent with our commitment to neutral, nonpartisan defense of civil liberties issues. If, however, under that law, we took out radio, we couldn't afford TV, but if we took out radio ads as a public interest organization calling at the time uh, for President George W. Bush to uh, repeal the Patriot Act, because he was a can at portions of the Patriot Act that violated civil liberties, that would have constituted a serious federal crime under that law because it criminalized make advocating on an issue in broadcast before the crucial period running up to an election if you mention the name of somebody who was a candidate for federal office. So I explained all of this to my husband. I said, you know, I would be, he said, you ought to challenge that law, you know, by making that statement on a radio ad. He said, I don't think people understand that that's what this law does. And I said, well, I would be facing a five-year prison sentence if I did that. Is that a price worth paying for free speech? To which he said, yes. <laughs> You've got the right husband. <laughs> so, you know, there are unintended adverse consequences. You call something campaign finance reform, it sounds so good. You say, let's censor hate speech, it sounds so appealing. Uh, but if you look at the actual consequences of, of either well-intended law, I think it has to give you a lot of pause that free speech may well be the most pragmatic way of advancing our policy concerns as well as the most principled one. Wonderful. Well, the, here is the motion on the table. I'll just state it as neutrally as possible. Who agrees with the Supreme Court that speech can only be banned if it poses a clear and present danger? And who thinks that the Supreme Court is wrong and should change its understanding of the First Amendment? Wow. And, and uh, who's chilled <laughs> by the presence of the Supreme <laughs> of a justice. Court? <laughs> and, and who's, was, it, 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 did anyone change his or her mind because of this great discussion? 
Well, it's a unanimous group, and there are few principles in America that can unite people of incredibly different perspectives. Aside from this beautiful principle of free speech in the First Amendment, it is urgently important that all of us become ambassadors for the First Amendment and teach our colleagues and friends and fellow citizens about its historic roots and bring this sophisticated discussion to the world. The Constitution Center is going to do that, and I am thrilled to announce that, uh, to share, uh, that uh, the College Board is going to take discussions like this video, the one we've just created, as well as new ones which we we've, will create, uh, and put them on the interactive Constitution and bring them to all AP history and government students so that they will have a two-week module to learn the essence of the First Amendment. And then we need to think together about how to bring this to classrooms beyond AP classrooms so that students from 8 to 80 and all citizens can understand why this great principle is the cornerstone of American democracy. Thank you to the Stanton Foundation for supporting these great debates. On to San Francisco, and thank you all for joining. Great job. Great job.